What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the 585 Report. Mitch Broder alongside my co-host, Ryan Sullivan. And uh, actually, Ryan, I, I actually realized this as I was um, kind of creating the, the the link here, the StreamYard link that we use uh, to record. This is actually our 30th episode, if you can believe that or not. So we've actually made it to 30, which is, uh, it, it feels like, you know, it's gone by quick, to be honest. I mean, it feels like not long ago, you and me were sitting the dead of winter trying to like figure out this podcast. So uh, well, we've made it to 30. I'm just surprised Pierre hasn't fired me after my array of microphone and audio issues that took me about 15 episodes to sort out. So Pierre, for being patient with me, just like the Bills are patient with Josh Allen, I appreciate that. Definitely, definitely. And Ryan, like, you know, we were, we were talking about this like a little bit, you know, before we recorded, but, you know, we're starting to really get, I think, into um, – the fall where they starting to feel like fall again, aside from the cold weather that's now been rolling into the whole Northeast. But, you know, me and Ryan talk about it. Ryan's a teacher school starting up for him. I'm a student. So I've been back in classes again and the bills now have a 53 man roster. Finally, we actually know who's on this team, who's on the practice squad, who's just out of town completely. Uh, And we have a really clear picture. I think of what the Buffalo bills want to do here in 2021 and kind of what the identity of this football team is. And, you know, we do have some things to talk about for sure with this roster. Um, so, I mean, Ryan, I mean, you know, looking at this roster right now, and I, I don't want to get into too much, but overall, I think we can agree it was a pretty quiet day, I think, from one Bill's drive. There wasn't, I, I feel like this roster overall shaped up about how we expected it to. Yeah, I mean, we we talked about this kind of going into camp, and it, it was really our expectations. There wasn't a ton to be earned on this team in terms of jobs. You were fighting for special teams jobs. You were fighting for bottom of the end roster jobs. So there really was no shocks besides, uh, we'll get into it later in the show, but there's really one or two people that I think really surprised people that they're not on this roster right now. And besides that, it, it's we we're rolling out 11, no, our 21 of 20 of the two dudes that we rolled out last year in our starting lineup. Yeah, definitely. And I think what, what made this roster when the, when the 53 man roster dropped yesterday, I think what made this a little less complicated and what made it not so, you know, newsworthy, if you will. And I think it was the fact that Bam Johnson got traded. I think had the bills had gone into yesterday with all these seven defensive ends still on the active, you know, still on their roster. I think that it would have caused a lot of, you know, toss ups up in the air and made their decisions on who they're keeping, who they're not keeping. Um, far more interesting and far more tricky. But with Bam getting traded, it kind of felt like that that sort of was the one domino that if it were to fall, you know, the fact that domino fell, it kind of made things very quiet. I, at least that that was from my take as, as far as how things kind of broke down. Yeah, I mean, that was the one question, right? It was how are they going to roster all these rosterable defensive ends? Every single person would, the exception of Mike Love was a rosterable player in trading Daryl Johnson for a seventh round pick shows that. And for everyone who I know, I saw a lot of stuff out there today. How did we only get a sixth round pick for Bam Johnson? You know who also went for a sixth round pick like the day before? Shaq Lawson, who is, when you look at what he's produced over the course of his career, is a better defensive end than. Bam Johnson. Bam Johnson is an elite special teamer, it seems like. That's great, but I put this out on Twitter. At some point, he was going to have to climb that jet chart. He didn't. Being a great special teamer is only going to take you so far in a roster. That's why we talked about, when before the season start, whether it would be wise to keep a guy like Tyler Matakevich, another elite special teamer. But you got to be able to do something besides special team. Bam Johnson will have a long career in this league being a great special team or going from team to team to team to team. And he'll make decent money, money. But for this roster and this team and where we are in this in this build, it just didn't work out for him. And I, I hope he gets the reps that he deserves in, in Carolina. I got to say, Ryan, I was kind of surprised how many people uh, were really upset to see he got traded and really didn't understand why they traded him. And they talked about how, you know, Hughes and Addison are up there in age. And that was a young developmental guy to have. But to be honest, I really didn't think this trade was bad at all for the Bills. I think that Bam Johnson, you know, had a tough, I mean, 
we talked about it. he made himself tough to to keep off the roster with the special teams ability of course it's well documented how great he is in that phase of of football and there's no question i think from the, throughout the preseason we saw his game as a pass rusher has developed he's a better player as a pass rusher than he was two three years ago but that being said when you look at that argument of well we need a younger talent on the roster well what do you guys, you know, I kind of looked at it and said, what are you people talking about? I mean, the Bills have spent their first, you know, the last two years, their first and second pick, right, of, of this year, and then their first pick of two years ago uh, were on defensive ends. You know, Epinesa, Rousseau, Basham, it, you know, to me, those three guys, that's your young, you know, nucleus of that position moving forward. And I just thought that, you know, they got a good, like you mentioned, the fact they got a sixth round pick for a guy that they took in the seventh round. Right. How many, I mean, positive value. Picks, right. And most of their own picks don't even like make it in the NFL. This is a guy that the bills are only developed and they got, they got returned for. And the fact is that the bills were going to lose one of those seven D ends, keeping seven D ends in the roster. I mean, we talked about it. It was a possibility, but it always felt like that was never something that was going to really materialize. And the fact that for a player that they probably were gonna have to cut, they were able to get just something in return for, right? We saw this, and again, I know this is maybe unfair to put Bam Johnson in comparison to these guys, but like Russell Bodine, Marshall Newhouse, like guys that were clearly going to get cut, Brandon Bean found value for it in, in, in the trade market. So I think that overall, you know, I think this is a job well done to Brandon Bean that he got anything returned for a seventh round pick. And the fact is that, you know, the Bills have so many special teams players in this roster that they could find someone to fill Daryl Johnson's role at the end of the day. And and let's let's even flip it to kind of play both sides of this. Do you think if Mario Addison didn't have this uncuttable contract or this borderline uncuttable contract, do you think there's a world where Mario Addison wouldn't have been on this roster this year? To be honest, Ryan, going into the summer, I would have said yes. I'm not sure. Do you, I, I'm not sure they would have though, because the the leadership role and the fact that he's taken all these young guys under his wing and really gone out of his way to teach them and the, and the leadership that he presents in the locker room, I'm not so sure that Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott wanted to move on from him because the, I mean, from the glowing remarks they've given about his leadership skills and how much they value having those vets with the young guys, I, I'm not so sure they would have moved on from him. I mean, they didn't move on from Trent Murphy, who's a far worse player. Than Mario Addison and a contract that was far easier to get out of to begin with. So if you're not moving on from Trent Murphy, I don't think that even if Addison's deal was a lot easier to get out of, I'm not sure they would have done it anyways. Yeah, I, I think it's a unique situation. And Mario Addison definitely seemed like he played well in camp and into the good graces of the coaches. You know, he had that press conference that got that posted across Twitter. But, you know, one more thing to kind of just tie this all in with with the bigger picture here. If you go back and you listen to the show we did with Bruce a couple weeks ago, remember, it's hard to forget, Josh Allen is making big-time money right now or is going to be making big-time money for the next eight years. Now it's time to stock up on those draft picks. This is where those draft picks are going to become ever more important. Daryl Johnson, seventh-round pick. We can go out and get another 6-7 DN, Project DN, in the next draft and try to develop him into the next Bam Johnson. It did, like I've been saying all offseason, it's about getting more bites of the apple now. And I know it's not draft season. No one wants to talk about draft season. But getting that six-round pick could be valuable in, in either landing another guy who can be our special team's ace or just being ammo to go up and get another guy in the draft in 2022. I think there's a lot. It's only a lottery pick, but it'll give us a lot more flexibility. I think we'll appreciate it a lot more when we get to the end of the season, we get to next off season. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with you for sure. You know, and that's been that, I mean, Brandon Bean, just as, as long as he has a lot of picks, he can go do what he has to do. And I, and, and that's the thing, just give Brandon Bean as many picks to be flexible with, to move up and down the board, get the guys he wants and do whatever he needs to do. So I, I think to pretty much kind of wrap this bam conversation up at, the thing is that I know some people are upset to see Bam go, but in a weird way, this is a good sign for the Bills, right? Like Bam Johnson on most, on almost every, any other Bills team would be a for sh a sure fire lock on this roster. And it just goes to show the, the quality depth and just overall talent they have just not on 
just the defensive line, but this roster. The fact that a guy like Bam Johnson had to get traded because, hey, we weren't really sure he was going to really make this team. So I, I know that, again, I know he was a kind of a fan favorite guy, but this team is so talented that things like this, we're going to have to get accustomed to at least for in the next year or two. That good players might have to let go just because the roster's, I mean, there's only 53 spots and it's tough to keep everybody. So, um, but overall, though, I think Argus, I'll ask you this, right? Overall, like thumbs up, thumbs sideways, or thumbs down for Brandon Bean on this move? I mean, thumbs up. I, I, I think there's probably more context to be added down the road. What they do with this pick, what it becomes, what Bam Johnson becomes, right? If what if Bam Johnson's our next Wyatt Teller, obviously we're going to be sitting here kicking ourselves in the butt about it. If Bam Johnson is just a, a serviceable special teams player for the rest of his life, good move. And, and, and it comes down to that. And I, I just, in three years, Bam Johnson never really showed me, or two years, I think it was, Bam Johnson never really showed me that he was going to be anything special, right? We, he always has these great preseasons, never put it together during the regular season. There were snaps to be had during the regular season if, if he wanted them, if he could earn it, and he just, he couldn't. And, you know, I preach player development, I preach patience, but I think it was the right time to move on from a guy like that. Yeah, definitely for sure. So we do now have this full 53 man roster and we saw all the cuts roll in yesterday. And again, we've talked about it. It was a pretty um, quiet roster, um, you know, cut down day for the bills. Not as, you know, it, it felt like going into the day, it was pretty clear who was making it, who wasn't. Um, the biggest drama was the Bills waiting two hours to release the the cuts as everyone was on Twitter, you know, refreshing for seemingly well, forever. Pe- pe- but people got a little freaked out about uh, cutting everyone's favorite long snapper Reed Ferguson for a little while. There was a right. there was a there was a little bit of a panic about that one. Right, right. But he did resign today as as uh, everyone expected. But yeah, what's cool? I mean, I guess we could quickly talk about that. Your 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 boy Marquez Stevenson, Speed Stevenson. On IR doesn't mean the season's Bro. over, but I gotta ask you, Ryan, because you are, you know, the the head of the of the Marquez Stevenson fan club as, as of right now. Do you think that this is probably gonna be like Isaiah Hodgins, where we just don't see him for the rest of the season, or do you think there's a chance that maybe we see Marquez later down the road? You know, I think part A is that it depends on the seriousness of his head injury. You know, it. You don't see that a lot. So whether I won't speculate, maybe we'll have Alex on at some point and have him discuss what that injury might be, or he could follow Thigh Doctor on Twitter, and I'm sure he'll he'll be able to tell you. So I think that plays a role into it. I think part of it plays in the role of how good of a returner can McKenzie be. You know, I, I banged the table about it all year, and he showed it in the preseason. McKenzie buffed a punt. He buffed yep. a punt in the preseason. If McKenzie, if McKenzie is muffing punts. Week two, week three, if he's having multiple muff punts again this year, like he had last time he was a returner, then maybe we see Stevenson, you know, get called up and start to return some kicks. I've said McKenzie is wide receiver three, four, whatever on this team. McKenzie has a role on this team as a pass catcher. He's earned that. He's not going anywhere. That's not what I'm saying. I think in the preseason, Stevenson showed he was the better returner, not just on the one he returned for a kick, not just on where returned for a touchdown. I think you saw play after play of him finding space, getting extra yards. Not quite that Andre Holmes quality, but saw that burst and I think has that vision and that natural return ability McKenzie just doesn't quite have. And hey, McKenzie could prove me wrong. But this preseason, he was a better returner. So it all depends. I think it all just falls on on the shoulders of how good of a, uh, on a day-to-day basis, how good of a returner is Isaiah McKenzie going to be? Yeah, we'll find out. Um you know, yeah, I think I think McKenzie's returner was a little up and down uh, during the preseason. We saw some glimpses of, you know, what we hope Isaiah can be in 2021. And then, like you mentioned, we saw some of the stuff um, that got him run out of town in Denver and, you know, got him relieved of his duties uh, as the return man back in 2018. You know, so we'll see uh, how that works out. But, you know, like we mentioned, there weren't a lot of surprise moves but I think there was one surprise move on this 53 man roster that I didn't see coming. Ryan, I'm not sure if you saw this coming either or not, but to me, the only surprise cut that shocked me was Jacob Hollister. I, I really did think he was probably, I, I thought he was, I mean, I'm never going to say a lock for a guy that was kind of scooped up 
as a late free agent for not a lot of money, but I thought that he fit the offense pretty well. He had the familiar fam- familiarity with Josh Allen. And the guy that was, I mean, certainly a productive player, had over 60 receptions the past two years in Seattle and made some plays during the preseason, but Hollister finds himself cut, and it seems like there's no intentions to re-sign him. I mean, it they're not they're, they only put Stevenson on IR. Everyone else is practiced today, so uh, for me, I, I, I was surprised to find that Hollister was off to the 53-man roster and that there was no intentions as of right now to re-sign him. Yeah, I mean, Bean said as much today in his press conference as we record this on Wednesday that he's not coming back to this roster. And that wasn't because it seemed like he was a tight end too. The only thought that I really have could, or at least the rationale that I think could exist behind this, Hollister kind of could play that H-back role, a guy who lined up as that sniffer in the backfield could line up kind of play pseudo fullback, do a bunch of things, and maybe that's the role they saw for him as opposed to just being the backup tight end. And when you have Reggie Gilliam come in and show how good he is as a fullback in the run game, how passable he can be as a pass catcher, you can hand the ball off to him, and the Bills looked at that room and said, we got our one in Dawson Knox, we got our blocking tight end, in Tommy Sweeney, and we got a weapon in Reggie Gilliam, and there's just not room, or there's just too much redundancy in that room to justify bringing back Hollister. He's a unique talent. He had a good preseason, but maybe they just didn't see a use for him in this offense, in an offense that ran four wide receivers at the second highest clip in the league last year that loves to spread it out, that Brian Dable, an offensive coordinator, that if you look when he was the Browns offensive coordinator, when he was an offensive coordinator for uh, Alabama, and now he's never really been a tight end heavy guy. It's not an offense that that is going to really run the ball through their tight end maybe like a Kansas city does or some of these other teams do. So that's why I think it happened. Whether I think, I, I think Giga Palace could go on and have a nice season somewhere else. But if you're asking me why, I think that's why that, that he's no longer on this roster. Yeah. I've, I, I wrote down a couple things in my notes about Jacob Hollister and, and let's Ryan, do you, was there any other guy that surprised you as far as getting cut or was Hollister kind of that guy for you too? That was the only one that I was like, man, there was the only, I mean, the only other one that I really kind of, thought may be able to sneak on was Jamil Douglas. I thought he put together some nice reps at the end of games there and had some center versatility as well, but he's back on the practice squad as of right now. So he's still a bill technically, but that, that was the only other guy that I kind of had maybe sneaking onto the roster. Got you. Got you. Yeah. That's an interesting one, Jamil Douglas, but I, I think it's actually great to have him on the practice squad because he's, he's a serviceable player and you can never have enough uh, O-line depth, but um Back to Hollister, though, the, 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 the two things that are the three things I wrote in my notes um, that I think was my maybe sort of, you know, why did he not make this roster? And a lot of it's kind of, you know, what you said, Ryan. I think that Reggie Gilliam's strong preseason showed a lot for the Bills. Aside from the fact that he's clearly their fullback, he showed that he can be a ball carrier in the backfield. He showed that he can catch the ball as a receiver. And I think they kind of look at him and say, we well, can sort of deploy him and a lot of different areas. He could be a fullback. He can be a tight end. He can be a short yardage running back. And that, so I, I think that he's sort of, is a sort of fullback tight end hybrid, which sort of, which took the spot. And I also think this is a huge um, sign in, uh, of, of, of their confidence in Tommy Sweeney and not just his injury, but him as a player, because he is a little binged up right now, but it, clearly they have no issues. They believe he's going to be fine and healthy for the regular season. And a guy that, you know, Bills fans were really excited about a few years ago, sort of, you know, he had the uh, the heart condition last year because of COVID, was banging up this summer, sort of a sort of forgotten man. But I do wonder, Ryan, if they, like you mentioned, because this was kind of my last point, is at the end of the day, this offense is a lot of four wide. Maybe we'll see a lot of five wide now, even this season. Like, they don't use the tight end a lot. And part of me wonders that if they really believe that Dawson Knox is sort of that receiving tight end, they expect that he's going to be playing a lot of the snaps at that position and that they just wanted 
their other tight ends to just be rock solid blockers in the short yard situations and helping them run the football. And Tommy Sweeney is probably their best blocking tight end on the roster as of right now. So that was kind of my breakdown as, a, as to maybe why Jacob Hollister didn't make this roster is that I think that Sweeney gives them the blocking ability. And that was just like with Knox Hollister's blocking is not great. He's more of a receiver and Gilliam's versatility where he can kind of get put all across the formations. I think that might've made them think that Hollister is sort of this one trick pony and that he is exactly the same kind of role that Dawson Knox would be in that. They just believe in Knox more than him. So that, that was kind of my thought process as far as breaking down why Hollister is left off this 53 man roster. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think, it, I think part of it also speaks that they just, it's not a valuable role in their offense. Like period. Like you, I know we talked all off season. They need a tight end. They need a tight end. And I mean, we even talked about getting a, a tight end. We, I mean, you can go back and check the tape, you know, for the sake of intellectual honesty and go back and hear me talking about why, you know, a guy like John U. Smith or Brevin Jordan might be a good guy to accent, Dawson Knox and take some of his workload off him. But if Dawson, let's say Dawson Knox reaches his peak ability, cuts the drops off, cuts the or cuts the drops out, is able to be a much more efficient player, he's still probably only getting 400 yards, 500 yards. He's not going to be the focal point of this team. So if you're tight end one, if that's the ceiling for the production in your tight end one and how much you're willing to incorporate him into what you do in terms of um, in terms of production, then is it worth keeping that roster spot for Jacob Hollister? And I think that was that thought process, like you said. Would have been cool. I think, Jacob, you know, there's a lot of cool things that Jacob Hollister did that I thought made him unique. In this case, there just was not a spot for him when you look at where they spent, I think it was Thad Brown or Dan Feedy's tweeted out 34% of this roster is wide receivers and defensive ends and our defensive linemen. You had to find cuts somewhere else. They found it at the quarterback. They found the tight end, you know, and so they could keep their offensive line deep so they can keep their defensive line deep. So they can keep their pass catchers deep. You just got to make sacrifices. And, and that's the one they chose to make this year. And real quick, too, as we kind of wrap up this conversation with Hollister, I also think that, you know, Emmanuel Sanders and Gabe Davis sort of as a combination fill the role of what a tight end is in most passing offenses because Emmanuel Sanders is really good at kind of running those intermediate routes, finding the holes and zones, and moving the chains. And Gabe Davis, who is as a receiver a pretty good blocker, can be that red zone option. So I think that's another thing that, you know, I think I overlooked for sure that looking back on it, I understand maybe where this came from is that, that this receiving room, because it's such a talented and, and also diverse group, a lot of different skill sets in that room, in that room, the role of the tight end can kind of get divvied up among these receivers because they have so many different, like I said, so many different flavors of ice cream in there. So I think that's another thing that definitely, can maybe contributed to Hollister not making this roster is just because they got receivers who can kind of fill that role in a, in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Gabe Davis is your power slot. He can be a guy you line up in that slot where you'd probably, where you like to line a tight, up, some, tight end up sometimes and go be your physical, go win the ball guy in the red zone. So that depth just isn't needed at that spot. So it, it, it's just, it's a numbers thing and it, it'll be, Interesting to see, you know, if Hollister can lock, you know, fall in somewhere and see what he can do on a different team to see if we if we missed out or whether it, it was the right move. So from a player who was a surprise cut, Ryan, who is a guy who did make this roster that you were surprised by that you didn't see coming? Well, when I at the start, I look back at my very first thing that very first roster that I made. And I was just going to say Reggie Gilliam because he's a guy that I just, I thought would get put off this team. Didn't think a fullback was really necessary. Once he got with the fullback, once he showed it out, I was like, that makes sense. I don't think, I don't know how you look at this roster and think about anyone else besides Jake Kumaro. He was someone that you look at any 
draft or any draft prediction, any roster prediction from me, from anyone at Buffalo Fanatics, from anyone in on Twitter, no one, no one had Jake Kumaro making this team. As camp went on, it became more obvious that that was going to happen. And he kept showing up and he kept playing with the ones. And he, he we already knew he was a good special teams player. And he's a guy up until my final roster that I left off because I thought it would maybe be like a guy like Kumaro who played some of those higher, uh, played with the ones and twos, but just wouldn't have a role because of numbers and because, uh, you know, his skill set wasn't unique enough. And they kind of had a guy like him in Gabe Davis. But he proved me wrong. Maybe Aaron Rodgers is better at evaluating talent than the Green Bay Packers are at evaluating talent. He's got, seems to have sure hands. He finds ways to get open and catch passes. And I don't know whether he's really going to be a major part of this offense. I don't, I, I'm not predicting to have anything more than like 300 yards, 200 yards in the season. But he, you got to credit the guy. He came to camp and he, he showed out. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, Coomer was a guy that I don't think anybody had a had an inkling to idea that he, you know, the summer he would have. I mean, you got to give him credit because he played himself on in this roster and, um, you know, made a role for himself potentially. And that's another guy too. I wonder. I mean, I'm not trying to sit here and say that Coomer is going to be some weapon in this offense, but speaking of the tight ends, Coomer is their biggest receiver on the roster by far. I mean, he's six four. Uh, maybe even six five. He's a big dude, tall guy. He can run a little bit. You know, maybe that's a guy that kind of fills that role. But the guy that I was surprised to make this roster was, frankly, Tyrell Dotson. I did not think that they were going to keep Tyrell Dotson. I thought that the emergence of Andre Smith was for sure the end of Tyrell Dotson's time in Buffalo. Uh, but yet he found a way onto this roster, which is, you know, I guess you could say from looking back on this coaching staff you know, because they, they like him a lot, that maybe this wasn't so surprising, but I just felt that the competition and the quality depth, and not just the linebacker position, but in other positions would force them to have to maybe say goodbye to a guy like Tyrell Dotson, who is not a bad player by any stretch of the means, but, you know, he's not he's nothing special necessarily. Um, but, you know, he made the roster, he's on the team, and that, that was something that I didn't really expect, I guess. I'm not saying that I hate it or anything at all. I, I, I like Tyrell Dodson. I think he's a solid player. Um, that was a name that I, that was, that stuck out to me as one that I was not expecting to see on that final uh, 53-man roster. Well, it's funny that you almost slipped Tyrell Adams in there because that's exactly what I was going to transition to. The fact that every I think a lot of people, myself included, had Tyrell Adams as that guy who was that fifth linebacker. And when you looked at the numbers on this roster – it didn't seem any way that they were going to be able to keep six linebackers. But when you take away a tight end and you take away a quarterback, all of a sudden that opens up a spot. And you can tell when Brandon Bean latches on to a certain player or and really buys into the develop, development because they stick around on this roster. You might not see him on the field for a little bit, but they kind of hang around and eventually they – they, you know, they'll either step in and do something or they'll fade away into nothingness. But you've kind of seen that with Saran Neal. You've kind of seen that with Jaquan Johnson. These guys that it's clearly they like and they contribute on special teams, but they clearly see something in or, you know, hope they can still be what they saw in them. And Tyrell Dodson, to their credit, got him as an undrafted free agent. They, they weathered what seemed like at first a, a questionable legal situation uh, that ended up not, not being so questionable. And now he's on the roster for the second straight year. I think he didn't play as well as people thought in that Miami game, but he put on some flashy plays. He showed that he can tackle. He shows showed that he could stop the run, make tackles, all that stuff. Credit to him, another just guy that is going to contribute to this roster, it seems like, in special teams. And Andre Smith, a guy they traded for, he stood out more than anyone in that linebacker room, really, in, in that prison. Uh, you know, yeah, he had that hit on, on Justin Fields, but showing up, making tackles, 
and a valuable part of that special teams team who looks like maybe as opposed to Bam Johnson that you put him out on the field if you have to, he'll be fine. He'll be able to hold his own. So if we lose Tremaine Edmonds and uh, Matt Milano for any period of time, now we're feeling maybe we feel more comfortable with Andre Smith and Terrell Dotson than we did a year ago. So it just speaks to the, the, the development <laughs> they've had. And I'll go the same thing. I, I just didn't think there was a world where six linebackers made this roster. And, and they did. And, and I think it just shows you they really wanted to – it shows you that the issue they saw in this team last year was that front end depth. They didn't like their depth at defensive line. They didn't like their depth at linebacker. So they went out and they, and they beefed up that room and they brought in competition. And it looks like that, that front seven is better for it. Absolutely. And and our next kind of topic we were going to talk about was like surprised, like numbers of players, a position group. And those were, the two position groups that I kind of circled here was the, the fact that we have two true tight ends in the roster and six linebackers. And they kind of go on hand in hand as to why the numbers are like that. And I, I like that you brought up the depth problems they had in the front seven, because that was real. And we, I mean, that was especially, you know, in the beginning of the season, it was obvious that there were some problems up front and it's clear that they have made an emphasis all off season that, Sean McDermott and Brandon Bean were not going to allow that to happen again. They were going to make sure that they not only had quality starters up front in the defense, but quality depth as well. And we'll see if they've done it, but there's no question they've made an emphasis on that. And I was also kind of thinking about it, Ryan, with, the, with this tight end room. I know we did talk about it to, to a great deal, but I do want to touch on this. You know, looking back on it last year, Dawson Knox is really the only tight end sort of involved in the offense, if you really think about it. I mean, yes, they had Lee Smith, but... Uh, Lee Smith's not really much of an offensive playmaker and Tyler Croft was inactive for weeks at the end of the year. So I, I guess, you know, looking, <laughs> looking back on it, it's kind of understandable to see why they kept the, the two tight ends. And again, for me, like I didn't expect six linebackers, but uh, that that's what they, that's what they went with. Yeah. It, it shows you once again, you know, what they value. they, I think a lot of people would, would question the depth on the back end of this team. But the Bills, the last couple of years, even when they have good defense, they're getting run through. They they haven't just haven't been able to get to the quarterback. They haven't been able to really effectively stop the run on a consistent basis. So, you know, maybe it's an overcorrection. Maybe it's it's just enough of a correction, but they are going after the, the weakness they saw on that team last year. And it was just that front seven, that depth stopping the run. And it looks like now that they are going to be, should be at least on paper, a lot better at that. So is there any room for you, Ryan, that you were surprised by like the numbers they kept at a certain position or is the breakdown for the most part about what you expected? I mean, linebacker was my biggest one, you know, I, I was surprised now they kept seven wide receivers. Marquez Stevenson's now in IR, so it's back to six. I was shocked. I, I just didn't see a world with six linebackers. I didn't I thought Terrell Adams was was a near lock for that last spot. And I that was probably what I was the most wrong about. I really looked at Terrell Adams numbers in tackle numbers in Houston and what he was and how he looked compared to the rest of that team in Houston and thought that he could be a player that could be a borderline starter if he needed to, if a client went down, if, you know, it, it maybe even take Klein's job, but sometimes you just, you know, every bad defense seems to have their Preston Smith and he turned out to be more of a Preston or it's not Preston Smith, Preston Brown. And he just happened to look like he was there. Preston Brown. The only other thing that maybe I was surprised by was, I mean, they, they're shallow at cornerback. They cut Cam Lewis. They're, they're rolling out there with uh, Trey, Levi, Dane, Saran, Neal, and Teron Johnson. If someone goes down, if Teron Johnson goes down, you're relying on Saran Neal. If Levi Wallace goes down, you're going, you're relying on Dane Jackson. There's not a lot of exper- defensive experience. Saran Neal has been on this team as a return, as a, as a gunner for a while now, but there's not a lot of experience there if Trey or Levi goes down and one of the things I'll be looking at over the next, you know, this week, next week, 
seeing if they add a veteran corner who's been cut or to see if, you know, come trade deadline, do they maybe use that six round pick or six round pick in a combination of something else to get maybe a cornerback who's trying to get off a team and, and come to Buffalo because it, they've, you know, we know they were in on Steven Nelson. We know they, they were in on some of these other free agent cornerbacks. So that's the only other one was just how thin they were willing to go at, in the back end of that defense. Definitely. We'll, we'll, we'll see what they do. Um, you know, yeah, that the, the, for me, the only reason why I wasn't so alarmed by the fact that they only kept five corners was just because it seems like they've done that quite a bit uh, in the McBean era is go a little shallow at cornerback. Um, but we'll see. But again, I mean, right now we have the switch of three man roster, but that does not mean that from right now uh, until week one kickoff against the Steelers that the Bills wouldn't make a move for somebody. We'll see. I wouldn't anticipate it happening, but you never know. So looking at this roster, like, do you see Ryan, any surprise contributors, any guys that you look at and say, Hey, he, he could maybe give this team a lot or could add this role to, to, you know, the offense or the defense. Is there any guy that you look at and could be, uh, uh, or find himself a real role here for the bills in 2021. I'm going to go consistent with one thing I've been saying all season, and I was a little nervous after the first preseason game when I watched him play. And then in the next two preseason games showed me more and more of what I wanted to see in him. And that's Matt Breida. I wanted him to be that, you know, if, if Devin Singletary is your fastball, if Zach Moss is your changeup, I wanted him to be that slider. I wanted him to be that knuckle curve. I wanted to he that just different pitch that really throws teams off and forces them to be honest. That Detroit game, I was not impressed at all. I was, I was questioning whether he really had a role on this team because this is not a team that normally doesn't activate three running backs or doesn't activate three running backs for game day. And to justify that on a regular basis, I wanted to see that functional speed. It's one thing to be fast, but you have to be functionally fast. You have to be fast in game time. And he's done that. He did that in San Francisco, right? He had... 22 he, he two straight years he had the fastest run in the league in in real live game action he, and when he's been given a lot of carries before he's he's had a high yard per carry and then in these two games you finally saw kind of what made him special you saw him catching passes you saw once he got out in space he's hard to contain they use him on that jet sweep against the Packers last week and I'm not saying that Matt Breida is going to be getting a bulk of their carries but if you can manufacture four five six touches a game to Matt Breida and get them in get them in space and find ways that really accent his talent and really showcase his ability and let him do what he does best which is just be fast that's going to be something that this offense just does not have. And it looks like over those last two preseason games, he showed that. So I'm really excited to see what, if they activate Matt Breida, what kind of ways Brian Dable schemes them up to be used. I like that answer a lot. Um, and I do agree with you. I hope they find a role for him just because he, we, we've talked about it. He brings something to that, that backfield that they don't, that Singletary Moss don't have, which is the speed. And I really hope that he's not going to have the TJ Yeldon treatment where he's pretty much inactive every single week unless there's an injury. I hope that they find some value for him because he's such a home run hitter. And <laughs> even in the screen game, they threw a few, a few screens to him against Green Bay, and he made some good usage of those. So uh, I like that answer a lot. I'm going to go with, um again, I'm, I've been kind of redundant here with the tight ends, but I'm, I'm going to go with Tommy Sweeney, and I'm not predicting big numbers from Sweeney. I'm not pretending that he takes the tight end one role or anything <laughs> crazy like that, but he's filling that Lee Smith role, right? As the blocking tight end. But let's face it, Tommy Sweeney on the limited action we've seen, you can tell he's a far better receiver, far better pass catcher than Lee Smith ever was in his career. I mean, there is some, he has some athleticism. He has good hands. He's a pretty decent route runner. And I think the fact that they could line up in a 12 personnel with the two tight ends on the field and have two tight ends that can actually go 
and run routes and make plays. It doesn't it, like Lee Smith for me, like the only time he got the ball was on total trick plays and fully defense. Oh, you're never going to, you know, run with a 300 pound glorified offensive lineman. Well, Tommy Sweeney can actually go make plays, you know, against a linebacker and coverage possibly. So, uh, you know, I'm not, again, I'm not predicting anything crazy, but uh, you know, I can see Tommy Sweeney getting 20 or so catches this year, a couple touchdowns, just kind of giving this offense again, just another guy who can make, you know, some plays when his name's called upon. And I think it just gives Brian Dable a little bit more flexibility with his formations and play calling. Because again, like I mentioned, they didn't, they only really had two tight ends last year with Smith and, and Knox. And if they were both on the field, you knew that Lee Smith was probably the last read for Josh Allen. Tommy Sweeney, maybe Josh Allen will look his way from time to time. Well, I, I think that's perfect. You know, we I've been I just talked about Matt Breed as something unique. When Lee Smith was on the field, you knew it was a running play, or you were down on the goal line. You can put out Tommy Sweeney and maybe not tip your hand as much, and maybe you know disguise what you're doing a little bit more because he has a little bit more of that pass catching ability. And we I talked about just a couple minutes ago, right? Guys that McDermott and Bean latch on to as guys they see, even if they haven't quite produced yet. They've kept him around. They kept him around when he got hurt. They kept him around after myocarditis. Even as he's hurt now, they didn't keep Isaiah Hodges when he was hurt. But they've kept Tommy Sweeney when he's hurt. They see something there. They see something They see something special in him, whether it's being a diet Lee Smith or being a pass catching Lee Smith, however you want to describe it. So I, I really like that answer. He's someone that I've always kind of been intrigued by with just his size and his ability to block. And, you know, he, he was a decent pass catcher at, at Boston College, too. So I, I think that's a really good answer as well. So now that we've seen the cuts and we've now seen the practice squad that, that pretty much got released today and came together quickly, of all the guys who got cut, are there any players, if, if there are, who are some players who you feel like, Ryan, could potentially have a role with the Bills down the line? Well, I was going to say, when I had my show notes prepared last night, Nick McLeod. He had a great preseason. Mm -hmm. Why can't I say Nick McLeod now? Nick McLeod is on the 53-man roster of the Bengals. Kind of shows you the depth that they had on this team. He got picked up before he ever got back to our practice squad. So I look at this team, and it's a guy I haven't been super high on, but got better, has unique talents, and that's Rashard Wild Goose. We lost Nick McLeod, but a guy that's going to have a chance to develop in a in a defense that, and a second a coaching staff that specializes in getting the most out of their secondary talent, and. Once again, I, it's, it's the buzzword of this podcast today, unique. He's got a unique skill set in that room. He, he's fa he's a little bit faster. He got burnt. He he looked like a seventh-round pick or sixth-round pick, whatever he drafted him when, while he was out there. But I, I, there's something there. There's talent there. You can teach – you can teach, you can teach uh, – what's the word I'm looking for? You can teach technique. You can teach – Second, you can teach skills, you can teach, you can coach a guy up, but you can't teach traits, you can't teach speed, you can't teach sides, and it seems like he may have some ability there. So he's one guy I'm really interested to see how he comes in the camp next year. So I had two guys that I wrote down for this. Now, Wild, Wild Goose was one of them, which I'm not going to talk about him for too long because when you pretty much summed it up really well. And on top of that, I know I remember I remember during the pre-draft pre process, that with Wild Goose, a lot of people talked about that he, you know, he seemed like a pretty legitimate nickel prospect. And Darren Johnson is in a contract year, folks. Like, you know, I don't know if the Bills are really going to resign him. I don't just because of the money they got, they got to put it elsewhere. So I could see, you know, Wild Goose maybe coming into camp and having a, a chance to really win a nickel job possibly and or be a special teams guy. We'll see. Uh, but the other player I wanted to talk about who did make it on the practice squad and, you know, someone who I was very critical of uh, at the beginning of the summer, but I'll have to give him some credit here because he improved quite a bit. And that's Jake Fromm. Uh, Jake Fromm, I thought in that last preseason against the Packers, was pretty solid and 
he showed you the improvements. Like I thought against Detroit, his pocket awareness was re- pretty awful to be completely honest. He was holding on the ball for a long time. Wasn't really navigating the pocket, really escaping against the Packers. It seemed like he, you know, he's thrown on the run. He, he ran one in for a touchdown. I mean, he was just kind of playing smart within himself, but sort of, he just seemed more confident in himself and more confident what he was doing, what he was seeing. And I, again, I, I still have my doubts about Jake Fromm, but I I can't deny the fact that a the coaching staff clearly likes them. I mean, otherwise you know they they would have moved on from him, right? And, and B, this is the guy who could still come in and be that backup for Josh Allen. I mean, Mitch Trubisky is only on a one year deal, and they value guys who know their system. And for Jake Fromm going to camp next year, it'll be his third year in this Brian Dable offense. And I think that 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 is a big deal for them. Now, I we'll see if you know, they bring someone in, they draft someone, who knows. But I think that Jake Fromm showed enough this preseason that now we understand and see that there's, there's, there, there is something there maybe to work with and develop into a backup. I'm not saying that it's – I full-heartedly believe is going to happen, but I do think that, that Jake Fromm is certainly a name that, that I like to see around the building a year more just to see if he can build – continue to, to progress as a player and build on what he showed here in, in 2021. And this regime has drafted three quarterbacks, right? You drafted Nathan Peterman, Josh Allen, and Jake Fromm. Now you play the, one of these things is not like the other game. You're going to get Josh Allen. The, but the comp on Nathan Peterman isn't too far off the Jake Fromm. So we know that that's kind of a mold that McDermott, <laughs> seems alike for that position. And, you know, you take away Peterman's comical interception rate to start his career. He seems to be putting together a nice little career as a backup in Oakland and doing kind of the things that we thought he would do in terms of just being a guy who's going to make the right reads, who's not going to win you any games, but it's not going to lose you any games, have a little bit of functional athleticism, and I think they value that in a backup quarterback. And he showed that in a preseason. He didn't do anything exceptionally dumb. And he, he just, he looks what, what they look for in that spot. So, and with the offense and the team, they built around Josh Allen. They built around the, the depth of this roster. You can maybe get by for one, two, three games with a meh quarterback if you game plan it exactly right, if you stay in positive game script, all that stuff. A lot of big ifs, but maybe. So there, I think there's absolutely a future on this team if he can string together another preseason. It'll be interesting to see what they do with the draft next year, if they go out and try to find another backup, or if they find a, another reclamation project quarterback to bring in. You know, But I think that's definitely something that, I'm definitely keeping my eye on more going into the next season than I was before. I, I was noted Jake Fromm hater before this. Excuse me. One other guy that, that I had in my notes was Josh Thomas looks like a guy who, who maybe in a year or two could have a role on this roster. Once again, Jaquan Johnson, could he? Could Jaquan Johnson fall to that Bam Johnson fate that a guy who's really good on special teams and just can't climb that depth chart and you move him on out there to get someone else in there? Could Josh Thomas, like a guy, had some flaws, had some issues in coverage, had some issues, you know, here and there, but a guy who came in like ready, like part of my language, folks, he came into those games ready to fuck shit up. Like that's why we played. And McDermott loves that. And I love that in my in my safeties. He looks like a guy who goes out there, he's a heat sending nickel, and he wants to hit people. And he's a back on the practice squad. Another year in, the, you know, now it'll be year two in this defense. He's a guy that I think next year could maybe push Jaquan Johnson for that safety spot, for that backup safety spot, if he can maybe become a little more proficient on special teams. So that's the other guy that I, I, I'd i like to keep my eyes on for the future. Rated R Ryan coming out here. No, but <laughs> I agree with you, man. I, I really do. I, I he, he looks like he just wants to punish opposing players. He hits hard. He's a willing tackler. He does not mind getting you know down low by the line of scrimmage, which is things that McDermott really likes in his safety. So I agree with you. I think that that's a player 
that is absolutely worth investing in down the line because he could absolutely find himself a good backup special teams role on this team. It, it's, it doesn't look like it's going to be this year, but it, but it, it honestly could be next year. And I, I like that you brought that name up. Now, real quick, while we still have some time here, because the biggest news in this division by far was Cam Newton getting released and effectively Mac Jones becoming the starting quarterback for the New England Patriots. And there's been a lot of people talking how, you know, the Patriots look like, you know, that Buffalo needs to be put on notice now that the Patriots have Mac Jones and that, the, you know, they could win this division. I just want you to, you know, Ryan, what are, what are your thoughts, first of all, on Cam getting cut? And do you see, you know, Mac Jones and the Patriots really threatening the Bills, you know, chance of defending their title in the AFC East? I'm not fair afraid of Mac Jones. I think Mac Jones was by far my least favorite quarterback in this draft. There is not a thing about him that scares me unless everything around him is perfect. You know, I, I think New England's a little bit better than people are giving him credit for. So if that offensive line stays healthy, you know, and maybe he can put together some good numbers if everything is perfect around him. That doesn't happen all the time in the NFL. And and for Cam, you know, I'll, I'll put it out there. I'm a closeted Cam Newton fan. I, I, I just always love the way he plays. I've always loved his personality. I think the to this day, I will stop it. Anytime it comes across my Twitter timeline, I'll, I'll click on it, it, is the video of him hitting that route against Clay Matthews in that game where he was mic'd up. It, I think he's really cool. I, it just seems like between some of this vaccine stuff and just his injury history, that his time might be done. And, and I really saw a good take on Twitter from, from Mark, who I, I don't really know who he is, but he's he's out there on Bill's Twitter and always has a lot of good takes, that he could be a cautionary tale for Josh Allen, right? You, you can play physical and be this elite physical quarterback who tries to run through dudes but once you hit year nine, year 10, year 11, your body's going to start break down on you like you're a running back almost. So I, there's a cautionary tale in there for Josh Allen and the way he plays. But big picture, I, I think New England will be a very pesky team. They're not going to be a pesky team because of Mac Jones. Mac Jones will kind of be dragged along in that team. And that's why I, I have Damian Harris in two of my fantasy teams because that's what that team's going to be. Like, you want to talk about 1980s football, that's going to look like 1980s three yards in a cloud of dust football this entire season. And it's going to be infuriating because they're just going to do that all the damn time. But Mac Jones in a vacuum that does not really change anything about them or my outlook for New England. Yeah, I guess I'll start with Cam real quick. Um, I, I know it's kind of sad to see Cam sort of dwindle like this because most quarterbacks at 32 years old should, especially guys who've won an MVP in their career, who have had a Super Bowl appearance, should should be on a team somewhere. Um, and I, I will say, though, the, about Cam, because people are talking about how Cam kind of needs to be like Carmelo, right? And just sort of accept that he's no longer in the prime of his career, and if he wants to stay in the NFL, be a backup. Um, and I do think that maybe at times Cam Newton has almost been his worst enemy specifically with his time, with the Patriots, but, um, you know, things worked out how they did. He's on the team. It's too bad. I, just like you, Ryan, I, I, I always have liked Cam Newton a lot. I think he, at his prime and his heyday with Carolina, um, I thought he was one of the most fun players, most entertaining players to watch in football. So it is a little tough to see, uh, kind of his career has gone downhill here the last several years, but talking about Mac Jones, I'll say this about Mac Jones. So when the Bills or when the Patriots drafted him, I, I, I tweeted immediately. Said, I am not scared of Mac Jones one bit. Now, I'll be honest. Mac Jones has looked better than I thought. He has a little bit more playmaking ability than I anticipated. He's not a statue. He can move. He can make some off-platform throws. He can move around the pocket a little bit. You know, he's not Josh Rosen 2.0. Um, but I agree with you in the sense of that Mac Jones ceiling is only so high especially compared to these other quarterbacks he was drafted with. So that is why I I believe that he, he's only as good as the Patriots are, right? Like, if the team around him is really good, yes, like, they could contend for the division. With Bill Belichick there's, and Josh McDaniels and some of the talent they have, yeah, they could contend for the division. But if the O-line gets banked up, if their lack of receiving depth starts to become a problem, 
you know, Mac Jones doesn't strike me as a guy who can really elevate, you know, players to, to, to a new level. Um, so some of the, you know, takes, you know, I've heard about the Patriots being, you know, the bills, like I think Booger said, like the bills need to be put on notice after this move. And that, like, I think Colin Coward just had, uh, projected the Patriots are going to have as many wins as the Bills this year, both going 12 and 5. Like, I don't know if I, I – it could happen. Like, it could happen. I'm not saying there's no shot that happens, but I think a lot needs to go right for New England in order for them to win the AFC East versus Buffalo, where if the whole team can be could be playing a shitty game and Josh Allen could just whip up a couple good plays, a few drives, and, and that's it. It's done. It's over. You know, and I, I just don't think that – the page really have that ability with Mac Jones. So I guess I'm somewhere in the middle where he's better than I thought at this point, you know, but I, I still, I agree with you, Ryan. I still don't see the Patriots um, coming after the bills necessarily. I, I think they will be a really annoying team. If they're in positive game script, like if they get up, if it's a mm-hmm. close game and they can just, pound the rock and sit back there and throw. I think they're going to be an annoying team. And I think I, I have them as the second best team in the AFC East right now. It's just, I just don't think they have that talent around them. E- even the pass catchers around him. He was in Alabama with, with Jalen Waddle, Devante, Devante Smith on all, you know, uh, Landon Dickerson, Alex Leatherwood, all these guys in front of him. And he just, he doesn't have that equivalency here. Nelson Aguilar is not, Devontae Smith. Uh Kendrick Bourne's not Jalen Waddle, right? It, it's gonna be a lot tougher for him. And you there's a reason you don't always see a ton of success. Now, Bill Belichick's still the greatest defensive mind in football, as always, as a qualifier, but it it they're back to where I, I think there's this aura around him, right? That Bill Belichick will figure it out. Bill Belichick will figure it out. When in reality, they're they're back in in quarterback mystery land that the Bills existed in for 17 years, and they have to crawl their way back out just like Buffalo had to. Yeah, definitely. We'll we'll see it all kind of winds out. At the end of the day, Mac Jones is a rookie quarterback. He's gonna have his ups and downs and that's why, you know, I'm not gonna put so much stock in the Patriots until I see it from them. So that about does it here for the five eight five report. Uh before we sign off, so starting in the regular season, I believe I, I you know I said something about it next week, but or last week, but starting the regular season. So that will be for us next week. Our time slot has changed. We are going to be dropping now on Wednesdays. That's when our show will be releasing. So no longer Saturdays. It's going to be Wednesday at the same time. Wednesdays is noon, uh, but we'll be dropping on a different day of the week. So just a heads up, keep an eye on for that. Um, you know, we're going to get to break down some games also coming up next week and do a little bit more pregame stuff, which is always exciting. Always, you know, a fun time for sure. Um, anything else, Ryan, that uh, we should mention before we sign off here? Um, just keep making sure you check out all the great Buffalo Fanatics content. I know I just saw Clay and Kendall are doing a film room sometime this week, so probably probably already be out by the time this is out. Uh, I highly recommend go checking out that. That stuff's always really, really good. Keep checking out Air Raid Hour. Keep checking out uh, Rico Report. Keep checking out all the great articles that that mitch and zach are editing and everything and it's the the season's ramping up and we're ramping up our content so you should really uh keep keep checking in we appreciate you following us up to this point so for ryan sullivan i'm mitch broder thank you so much for listening to the 585 report and we will see you guys next week have a great rest of your day